Let's get into some testing right here. What I want you to understand in this is there's no Tesla coil hooked up. This is basically just the motor speeds and the high voltage. So he'll tell you when he turns on the high voltage, he does it in three increments. I like to think of it as a 369 effect. Turns it on to about three, waits for a few minutes, turns it on to six, waits for a few minutes, then turns it on to nine. Now, what you'll see is him adjusting his motor speeds. That is to give it a resonant value. When you start seeing on his oscilloscope where the lines start to cross, he's getting a resonant value. Another thing to note here is he's going to pulse his piezoelectric disc in this process. That's the ultrasound machine. There is also a time delay in what he's saying. So we're looking at three to six seconds before the audio and the video catch up. Right. I'm going to turn it down to 85 kilohertz, see if that gets us closer or farther away. I can hear the, the change in the beep frequency. Not the beep frequency, the brush going... Alright, what do we think? Has 85 gotten us closer than 90? I'm not touching it yet. It's, it's still changing. I'd say 85 has had a greater effect on the bottom rotor speed via the top rotor, of course. And we can see that there was some kind of release of energy here, some kind of arc. Now let's go down to 80. I might be going in the right direction. Nope, I don't think it was. Sounds like the brush is hitting a little faster now. The goal is to make the brush hit like constant or not at all. That means that the vibration is lessened. All right, let's change the frequency up to eighty seven five. Oh, it's getting better. I can, I can hear it. Hopefully this audio is coming through well. I'm going to go up in frequency a little more, go up to 89. He just said that the frequency he just put into the ultrasound was 89. 
Remember that number, it'll come up later. So I think you can calculate the RF frequency necessary based off the ultrasound. Um, my chart shows that it should probably be 20 times the frequency of the ultrasound is the frequency of the RF, or the ultrasound is 1 20th a wavelength of the RF. No, other way around. 1 20th the frequency, 20 times the wavelength. You know what I mean. I hope. Okay, okay. Starting to get a little closer down there. Oh, look at that. It inverted. When it inverts, that's when special stuff happens. Oh yeah, it's getting special now. Yeah, see? The bottom rotor is kind of speeding up with it. It's hitting that special resonant state. I can hear it. All right, so I must be getting close with the ultrasound frequency. Let's key the mic. Let's uh, key the mic on the proper frequency. Let's see, I am at 89.9 .9 times 20. I should be at 1798. All right. Key the mic, you're gonna see big old spikes everywhere. Keep the mic for just a little bit, and I'll let it go. When he's doing these calculations, it's by 20. However, I think his number is wrong. Here's why. I think it's only by five. The resonance value of this plate is right around 426 to 440. So by five, we're getting in the resonance value. By 20, we're overshooting it. But we're still going to hit it when it gets to the 20. We can hit it a lot sooner if we do it by five instead. All right, so you can see we, we kind of hit this resonant state and then I keyed the mic. And the act of keying the mic looks like it affected the top rotor speed, right? The top rotor speed has now lost that resonant state. It might go back down to it, but I feel like this video is getting long enough as it is. How about I just measure the, the high voltage and then I'll turn off the ultrasound. All right, yeah, there we go. I'm at negative 17, negative 18. Yeah, I maxed out the thing on the bottom. So right now on the bottom, it's got plenty of charge. If I pulse the ultrasound and then measure that again, we'll see I have lost the uh, strong negative voltage on the bottom. Um, voltage on the top, negligible. We're at like 0.4 kV on top. So right now we're in a good state to pulse the ultrasound. So off, one. Two, three, four, five. On. One, two, three, four. Off. One, two, three. On. One, two. Off. One, on. Off. On. Off. On. Off. On. So now that I've missed it, and I didn't have the RF pulsing with it, so RF on. Pulse it. All right. Have I lost my negative voltage on bottom? I have not lost it on bottom yet. I'm still maxed out on bottom, so I could probably... I could probably keep testing, but uh, I have a negative. No, I got positive one on top now. So that positive one means I'm probably a little too positive on top, I think. So what's actually going on right here? 
Well, the charges are going from the bottom to the top or the top to the bottom. They're not being divided. So what we're going to have to go ahead and take a look at is what Alexi said about this and how he's keeping those things divided. The disks begin to form a field around themselves when we charge them with a lot of power. Mechanical rotation of the disks turns this field into a toroidal vortex. What prevents the vortex from getting dispersed? Each vortex has different potential. We keep the lower vortex charged negatively and the upper vortex charged positively. I used my middle disk to prevent the vortex from dispersing. I kept it charged with an HV generator. The charge is pulsating so that my two toroidal whirlwinds remain stable. The magnets attached to them increase the power. When charging the disks with high voltage currents, I experimented with the frequencies and watched the effect on the toroidal vortices. The vortices curled around each other and created two toroidal whirlwinds. So where does that leave us? What it's telling us is that he's using his Tesla coil to divide the two whirlwinds or the two charges from the DC high voltage circuit. So he's only getting positive on top, negative on bottom. What does that also mean? When Jared's running this thing, he's getting the center plate to resonate. The resonating plate in the center is controlled by the Tesla coil, also by the frequency of the motors. This is what makes it hard to tune. This right here is an easier state to see. You see it once in a while, then it goes away real quick. Why? Because the Tesla coil is not backing it up. Again, let's hear from Alexi one more time, and we'll get back into the experiment. I used my middle disc to prevent the vortex from dispersing. I kept it charged with an HV generator. The charge is pulsating so that my two toroidal whirlwinds remain stable. I'll try doing another pulse, we'll see. going on entered like a runaway state or something That was weird. That was really weird. Let's check in on it. What the crap happened there? And it, it didn't sound like the bottom was slowing down. It sounded like the top was speeding way up. I don't know what happened there. Weird stuff, Maynard! There's a lot of sparks on the underside there. Maybe I can... 
Get the camera down lower where you can see it. Yeah, when I key the mic. See if I can get that in the shot. Key the mic. Look at all those sparks. Yeah, I think we're getting daggum close, buddy boys. Daggum close. I'll take one more measurement and then I'm going to turn it off. Mm, yeah, I'm at negative 12, negative 14, negative 21. Yeah, still maxed out on bottom. That's good. Uh, and then on top, or plus one point, plus two on top. Yeah, I've transferred too much charge to the top now. Uh, high voltage off. I'll let you see what happens to speed with the high voltage turned off. Zoom in on the... Speed here a little more. And now look, with that high voltage turned off, look at what happened to this top disc and bottom disc. Look at how all that stuff goes crazy. It's crazy, man. It's crazy. Now that we saw that test and we understand it a little better, let's move on to the resonance frequency because he was hitting it and then coming out of it. So how do you find it? The way I look at it is you take a tuning fork and you put it on here. You strike it and you put it on here. You put a mic up to it. And what you want to find is what's resonating all of the aluminum. Not just what's resonating the particular piece you're putting on. But does it resonate the center disc as well as the outside aluminum? Again, same material, different thicknesses. We want to make sure it resonates everything. When it does, you know you got the resonance frequency. When it doesn't, you don't. So let's take a look at the test. Now let's see if we can't put the two tests together. Remember the buzzing sound? We're going to play the video again of the first test. We're going to see if we can't spot that frequency inside of the test. Let's check it out. Picking this thing out is like a needle in a haystack. Here's the thing. 
when they get close together the motors and they start getting in the resonant frequency you'll start to hear the center disc start to make the sound that's where it is I showed you the points in there half of you might hear it half of you may not I understand either way I'm hearing it in this device let's go ahead and take a look at this in a different way he said his frequency was at 89 we take 89 and we multiply it by 5, like I said earlier. What does it give us? It gives us 445. What's the significance of getting that number? Well, we're all within the frequency of A. Whether you go down to 427 or you can go up to 450, you're still in the frequency of A. It cuts down the ballpark of where our resonance frequency is. Aluminum, I used 427 on the aluminum when I tested it. Now, we have an understanding. We're getting to right where the frequency of the resonance is inside that plate. You're probably wondering, your motors don't go anywhere the speed of 440. Well, you're right but they do go right around 890 which is a multiple by the way of 445 if you multiply it by 2 you get 890 now why is that significant because the distance in which you're hitting these things at is on a pulse rate you're seeing it come into it and hit it and then go out of it frequency is a little different than you what you would think it would be on your oscilloscope Normally, you'd see little pulse waves and one wave going arching all the way over the top of it at a different frequency, but it doesn't work that way. It actually works by multiplying or dividing by two. As long as you do that, you can take your initial, initial frequency and divide it down or multiply it up, and you're going to hit that resonance in that disc. The tests prove it out. You can disagree with me all the way on the math. But the tests are proving out that this is exactly where the frequency works at. And this is where the resonance hits. Therefore, it must work this way. The tests are better than the math in this experience. I'm going to tell you that right now. It is going to work out when you hit it at those numbers. What does that also mean? When your lower disc gets down a little lower and your upper disc gets up a little higher, and frequency because the rotation is the frequency you're going to see that it's going to hit at different points one will be resonant while the other isn't the reason the Tesla coil gets put in all this is for this one factor it has to smooth all this out it has to put a rapid frequency into that center plate to get it to resonate properly to keep the two fields apart that's why it's so important. We work out what it is to resonate it at what frequency. Now we have to figure out how to get that Tesla coil to resonate somewhere in that frequency band in order to separate those two charges on the top and bottom and never let them cross. All right, one last thing on the frequency here. I keep hearing a tune in my head and I've described it several times and I want to make sure you guys can hear it as well. It's the sound my 3D printer makes when it goes in circles. And, sure enough, it sits right around the same resonance frequency, partially, as it goes when it goes in resonance. So, here's the tune, just so you can hear it and understand what I keep hearing in my head. My Gravity Flyer made this tune one time. Only once out of all the thousands of tests I've done. It's only done this exact frequency pattern once. We're going to take a look at one more experiment on this. Again, my T-Brain's got it working here. Let's take a look at what he does and see what his observation is, and we'll come back and talk about it one last time. You can see here that mid plate has got quite the nice little... So now as I tweak the speed at the bottom, just a little bit to bring it closer in resonance.
So what's going on here? Well, you're getting a lot of eddy current. What you're noticing is he expanded his center disc, a different model than he used in the previous video. He expanded it, and it's thinner than the other model. What's going on now? As the eddy current works, you're getting a vibration in your disc. The eddy current doesn't just go through the aluminum above it into the center disc. It goes into the disc above that. So all three are tied together. What happens is, as the bottom one goes, the top one wants to go the same direction. That's the problem. What is that going to do? It's going to cause a break on the top one. It's going to want to slow it way down. When those two points are getting close to each other, and you can see it on the oscilloscope, when those two points get together, they make a resonance point. Now, is it the point where it's really vibrating hard or when you don't feel it vibrate at all? The answer is simple. Resonance works by vibrating an object at a molecular level. It's lower than the level that, level that you see with your eyes. That's the difference. You're going to see no vibration in it, but the actual frequency in it will be higher. When you get the massive vibration, the frequency is going to be lower. It's actually counterintuitive to hit the massive vibration in that disc than it would be to get the resonance properly into it. So, hopefully you understand that. Keep watching. It's a good video. So when you adjust the high voltage, what happens? It puts pressure on the center disc. Just understand this. As you have more voltage in there, both are directed towards the center. The high voltage goes on. It puts pressure on the center plate going down from the top one. High voltage goes on on the bottom. It sends pressure to the plate in the center again from the bottom. Bottom, let's bring that top down. 
Now let's talk about the Tesla coil in the center disc. Why is it so important? We obviously learned today about the resonance and what it needs to do. But the way it's hooked up is also important. Now I've run a Tesla coil to the center disc and I've connected it directly. Let me explain to you how this works. As the eddy current and the high voltage gets kicked into that center plate, you get a back EMF. You will blow MOF sets all day long. I can't explain to you how frustrating that is. Five minutes into a test, you're blowing a MOF set. No matter how much you cool it, you're blowing it. The reason the wire goes down inside the center of the number two coil is so that you can eliminate some of that back EMF. At that point, it's working off of a voltage inside of the coil itself not connected to the coil so there's a break there i don't know how to explain it other than to say put a wire down the center of a tesla coil and look at it it looks like a light show it's a spark factory you're going to see a bunch of voltage going on down there that's what it's doing it's separating it it's giving you the frequency but it's separating the tesla coil itself what does that also mean the distance of the wire going in controls the exact frequency instead of the Tesla coil itself. It's a huge tuning problem if you don't understand that. It's going to frustrate you for a long, long time. Just do what I'm saying and it'll work properly. I wanted to mention one last thing. The piezoelectric disc. You saw it being pulsed on and off on our first experiment we looked at. What's actually going on here? I couldn't explain it then because you didn't see the eddy current yet. Now that you see the eddy current, please understand what I'm trying to say here. When you have all of those things moving up and down in the center plate, when you pulse that piezoelectric disc, what are you actually doing? What is it achieving? The center plate movement, the actual center plate. Also, the two disc plates are going to move as well. They're all interconnected with that eddy current. As you pulse this thing down, it forces a pressure wave on those things. And it creates that disc to go down for one second. And boom. Just like that. Boom. Just like you're hitting the base of a speaker. It's forcing it down. I said before it works on sound. you got to start to see this in there. Pulse it. Boom. Force it down. That's your jump. With all that being said, let's hear from Alexi on this one last time and see how he saw this thing working. This piezoelectric emitter, it's been assembled as a part of the disc, creates enough ultrasound for this entire system. It radiates this whole apparatus with high frequencies. The HV generator also creates a high frequency impulse. Now we need to create a resonance with those parts of the design. We become subject to the law of centrifugal movement if the object doesn't shrink. That's when all the classical laws of physics work. The centrifugal force of the Earth will eject the object as far as possible. There are six magnets laid out in this manner. Why six? Why not four, eight, nine? Take a look. We'll get a honeycomb structure if we connect every dot within the circle. Add two longitudinal brushes, which got rid of the electrical charge during rotation and transformed it into electrons and positrons. The discs are rotating. Those two motors power two discs. Two toroidal vortices are created. The middle disc keeps the vortices from dispersing. It has a neutralizing effect, and gravitational waves envelop it. Why do we need this ultrasound part? Remember how Hutchinson experimented with longitudinal waves? He directed his emitter towards the objects, and they levitated. The video mentioned how those emitters were projecting high-frequency impulses. An object would change its frequency properties once under the influence of those energies. This made them levitate. Any object also powered by electrons can lose its mass. What does this mean to us? It means that the Earth's gravitational waves are warped and circumvented. I will leave a link in the description for the two videos that I showed today from my T-Brain. Anyway, if you like what you guys saw today, please like, share, subscribe, do all that fun stuff, and have yourself a great day. Thank you very much.